The late 2020 MacBook Air M1. Built like a tank. Speed like a missile. I'm just joking, this isn't a... Uh, 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 <laughs> this isn't a car review, this is a review not even a review. Six reasons you should buy the late 2020 MacBook Air M1. The first one is price. You can now pick refurbished ones up at around $650. More so, there are so many secondhand deals on Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist, etc., where you're gonna find ones that are in nick condition, barely used for even lower. If you haven't seen it, I made a review a little while back about this computer, and I had so many comments on that video of people saying they picked up the MacBook. I got one for $400 as an upgrade from my 2014 Air. Bought one on Monday for $700. This thing is insane value for money. Got one off Facebook Marketplace, eight gigs, 512 gigs storage for $600, battery life 98% with only 35 cycles. The point is, my point with all these comments, is because this was made in 2020, there are so many secondhand deals of people who bought them, never used them, didn't like Mac OS, you can pick one up at an insane price because of the two upgrades that came later. The second reason is how compact this is. And I, I, if you haven't felt one of these things, it's about as thick as my phone with a phone case on it, which is just, it blows my mind that there's so much power in this really thin thing. I've been using the M1 MacBook Pro for a while. It's a big, bold machine, and this thing is like an iPad compared to it. It's 1.3 kgs, which is 2.8 pounds for my American viewers. There is no use case where compactability isn't your friend. The third reason you should get it is this thing's battery life. On the Tom Guides battery test, which involves continuous web surfing at 150 nits brightness, the MacBook Air lost an insane 14 hours and 41 minutes. That's a tad more than the Air M2 at 14 hours and 33 minutes. So the battery lasted longer, but it's not as long as the M3, the Air M3, which lasted 15 hours and 13 minutes. Do I have to say that the Air 3 is over double the price of this thing? and the batteries basically lasted the same. The most important to me as an editor, as a creator, as someone who wants a good laptop is its performance. We're gonna run into some live tests while I was actually editing and I'm gonna show you what the performance was, but charts are sometimes important too. The Geekbench single core for this MacBook Air M1 was 1,728. MacBook Air M2, it was 1,911. Really negligible, you're not gonna feel a difference at all. The point here is M2, just don't get it, all right? The MacBook Air 13 inch M3 was 3,082, a lot more than this. For Geekbench Multicore, the MacBook Air M1 came out at 7,581. The MacBook Air M2 came out on a score at 8,965 and the M3, 12,087. For Handbrake, which I use all the time for video encoding, the M1 came out at nine minutes and eight seconds. The Air 2 came out at nine minutes and 31 seconds. Again, negligible difference. And the M3, seven minutes, 19. Does that extra horsepower, does the double cost of the M3 actually justify it? Do you need it, all right? And this is where the beauty of live tests come in. When I was using this M1, there is not a single point when I was just, you know, surfing the web, uh, watching a video, doing some general word processing, typing notes, etc. You know, just general stuff that you're going to do day to day. There's not a single point where it lagged, stuttered, and made me feel like this was a slow machine, which I think is really cool. So if you're into that, you're going to not have any problems whatsoever. For us content creators, which is pretty much what this channel is about, editing, making cool videos, I did do some tests, and I think the results were extremely eye-opening for me. For editing, I tested three different programs, Resolve, Final Cut, and CapCut, because I know there were so many of you who watched the last review and said, look, we don't really use CapCut. We want to see this thing and how it performs in other software. So I did that for you. I'm going to go top down, which editing software performed the best to which editing software performed the worst. First up, we have DaVinci Resolve. The footage that I'm using is also important to mention. I'm using a 4K 60 frames a second 422 Sony footage. This footage is not light by any means, it has a massive bit rate, and it's the same footage you're gonna find on the A7S III, the FX3, the ZV-E1. It's kind of the highest codec of footage other than 120 frames a second. This indicator shows us that we're at 29.97 frames a second with absolutely no problems playing this back. This is footage that's been slowed down to 30 frames a second. I'm gonna to go to the next footage, next footage, next footage. 
You can see at no point does our frame rate drop upon playback. So I got curious. I asked a DaVinci user what effect or transition really has a big kind of pull on the system uh, in terms of its performance. And he said, what was it? He said the smooth cut, right? His machine, which is a Windows machine, struggles to do the smooth cut. Did anyone see any frames? There was not even a single stutter playing that. Anything in Fusion. So this clip was made in Fusion. I added a title onto it. Let's play that. 100% smooth playback in DaVinci Resolve. And that's what I wanted to reveal to you guys. DaVinci Resolve performed the best out of the three softwares. It handled this footage. This machine handled this footage like you would not believe. There wasn't maybe one or two points where it lagged for a second and just had to buffer. But other than that, it's been incredible. The second best performing editing software was actually Final Cut, not CapCut. So that's interesting, stick around to find out why. Same thing here, we have 4K, 60 frames a second footage straight from the Sony. And if I play that. Let's do it. We're here. Titles. A really cool effect. This is what it looks like. Speed ramps. And uh, you can see that this timeline is by no means a joke. This is actually from the speed ramp video that I did. Why I say it performed worse than DaVinci is that it wasn't as smooth at points. Look, there's a lot more effects in terms of the color grade that I did. Let's look at this multi-layer track that I did here. Let's play this. See, I've clicked play and it's buffering a bit. There we go. There's some issues with it. Let's pause that and restart. Do you see, we, we definitely have a loss in frames here. Now, now it's caught back to itself and we're playing at uh, real time, but you can see for a couple seconds there that it was struggling. Now I've added some titles, some inbuilt Final Cut titles as well. It'll handle that with no problems. But you can see here when we start to layer the Sony footage on top of each other, that's when it starts to have an issue because it's having to encode and play back multiple layers of footage. I can just tell you by using this and what you're seeing on screen right now, the playback in terms of what frames we're getting and refresh rate we're getting while using it and scrubbing through, it's not the same as DaVinci, which just felt like this machine usually does. And that by that, I mean seamless, flawless, no problems with lag whatsoever. It, it just feels a little bit more clunky. Can you edit a video on this? You definitely would be able to edit, but it's gonna, you're not gonna get 100% smooth results. And I have the reason why that is. You can also see here in the activity monitor while we were using Final Cut, it really used a lot of the CPU and the GPU, but mainly the RAM. Why it's using GPU and CPU is because Final Cut has, if you've enabled it, a live render feature where as soon as you stop kind of recording, you're gonna have your video start to render. That's how you get smooth playback generally. If I feel the Mac right now, it is getting a bit warm because Final Cut is constantly trying to render. So again, just to summarize here, you definitely can edit on it, but not as smooth as DaVinci Resolve. Let's move on here to the software, which surprised me the most, but performed the worst, which was actually CapCut. So this is extremely peculiar to me because when I was doing machine tests yesterday in CapCut, it was lagging a ton. And now, funnily enough, coincidentally, while I'm recording the screen, which uses processing power, and in the same project with 4K 60 frames a second Sony footage, the software is actually playing back smoother than it did yesterday. And pretty much as smooth as it could be. You can see here, as I click play, our player is playing back in real time. There's no kind of lag whatsoever. So here we go. You can see on this footage that the video is definitely lagging on these two shots for some reason. But for the most part, in every other clip, we're getting 100% smooth video playback. It's playing the titles in full playback, no problems whatsoever. And this is the same footage that we used in DaVinci Resolve. Bottom line, can it handle editing up to 4K 60 frames per second footage? It definitely can, DaVinci being the best again. You're just gonna struggle if you're doing 6K and 8K footage. This machine only has eight gigs of RAM. And while I was using all these editing softwares, the RAM usage was definitely the highest consumption. It's because of that reason that I would highly suggest getting 16 gigs of RAM. It is gonna have a monumental impact on your experience while using this machine for not as big as a price jump as getting the M3. The fifth reason I think you should get this is because it is a heavyweight for its price. We could compare this M1 to other Intel-based MacBook Airs. And anyone who's come from Intel-based MacBooks to M1 knows that they would absolutely never go back. So that really isn't even a comparison in performance. You'd never really go back to an Intel-based MacBook and I 
really don't recommend it. What else can we compare it to? Some Windows laptops like the HP Pavilion 14 inch for $600. Now I actually know someone who has this and uses it day to day and he loves it. It's great for him. It's got a similar performance in terms of day to day use, but when it comes to editing and higher kind of GPU and CPU consumption uh, software like editing, it really isn't gonna match up to this MacBook. In addition, the build quality of this MacBook just feels better to any kind of Windows laptop that I've used before. If you've stuck around this long, the sixth and last reason you should get this are simply the customer reviews. Let's turn to one of the greatest congregations of wisdom and knowledge there is out there, Reddit, all right? So I researched this Mac on Reddit and I found a couple of cool comments and a thread that spoke about this M1 MacBook Air. I purchased the M1 base edition that I picked up for $800. This was five months ago. I do a lot of editing in Photoshop and Lightroom too, no regrets. Not outdated at all. I got both at home, M1 and M2, and I don't see any difference unless I'm doing something exceptionally demanding on it. I do everything you're doing, plus video editing and YouTube for music on an M1 8 gig, and it's still a monster machine. I got an M1 a few months ago because I hate the new design and honestly prefer the M1 because Apple runs the M1 cooler than the M2 and especially now the M3, which is a bit of a trade-off in performance there. Also, the storage is faster on the base M1. I know that the M2 storage was definitely slower than the M1, but I think they fixed that in the M3. So in terms of storage speed and your disk speed, these are gonna be a similar specs. And there we go. Those are customer reviews. Nobody in that thread that I was on, which was all about this MacBook, said anything negative whatsoever on it, from the performance to the build quality to its longevity that you have while using this machine. And I think really when people are speaking and praising it like this, there isn't really any reason to doubt that this is a great machine and that you can still use it in 2024. So those are six reasons why you should get this Mac in 2024 in conclusion. If you are gonna get this machine, maybe consider getting the 16 gig for the price you're gonna pay for that upgrade. It really is gonna be a lot of value for money. This machine has longevity and legs for the next couple of years, 100% and really, it is a great machine for its price. I hope you found this useful. Let me know how you experience it and what you use it for. Thanks so much for watching. I will see you in the next one, everybody. Goodbye.